Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Bihrush Shuturayev. I will be hosting today's IELTS Reading Marathon. I have been invited to host Reading Marathon due to my expertise in this component of IELTS exam. My personal band score in IELTS is 8.5 with straight 9s in listening and reading, 8.5 in speaking and 7.5 in writing. I have taken IELTS exam so far 13 times and out of my 13 attempts, I managed to get a band score of 9 in reading for 8 times consecutively. Now, why don't we look at our today's agenda? Lesson 1, I will give you some insight into IELTS reading. I will give you some tips how to deal with different question types. We will teach you how to manage your time under exam conditions. And I will give you some insight into skills that should be mastered if you are aiming at a band score of 8 or above under exam conditions. Lesson 2 and lesson 3, I will teach you how to deal with three question types that majority of students struggle with. So we will have a look at information identification, also known as true false not given. The second question type is identifying opinion of the writer, aka yes or not given. And last but not least, we will have a look at multiple choice type of questions. So why don't we start lesson one now? IELTS reading overview. You know that IELTS reading is conducted second in the main test. It comes after the listening subtest and before the writing. In IELTS reading, you are given three passages of increasing difficulty. These passages are simplified newspaper articles adapted from scientific journals like New Scientist, Economist, the National Geographic, and etc. You will be given 40 questions in total. So each passage should contain 13 or 14 questions. The most common format is having 13 questions in passage 1 and passage 2 and having one extra question in passage 3. Less common format is having 14 questions in passage 1 and 13 questions in passage 2 and passage 3. And the least common format is having 13 questions in passage 1, 14 questions in passage 2, and the same 13 questions in passage 3. So, why is that important to know the number of questions? Whenever you are taking IELTS exam, whenever you are transferring your uh, like answers onto the answer sheet, you should always have a look at the number of questions. If you don't pay close attention to the number of questions, you can swap its their places. I mean, instead of putting the number 14, you can put the answer for question number 15. So you see, all the answers are being shifted up. If you make such a mistake, all the answers that you put will be considered incorrect. Now, let's look at reading subtest appearance. If you are taking paper-based IELTS, you will be given one hour in total to answer all the questions in the question booklet and then copy your answers onto the answer sheet. Unlike listening exam, no extra time is allowed in reading. So what I suggest you to do, you start dealing with passage one first. As long as you finish reading passage one, you copy your answers onto the answer sheet. As soon as you finish reading passage two, you do the same. And once you finish reading passage three, you will copy your answers to answer sheet. I don't suggest you uh, copying your answers at the end of IELTS exam when you have 5 or 7 minutes left because it will put some extra pressure on you. You will be pressurized and there are more chances of making technical mistakes. But when you are taking computer delivered IELTS, it's much more convenient. So look at the illustration of the screen. On the left, as you can see, on the left side, you are given the passages, the passage. On the right side, you are given a number of questions. And somewhere in between, you have a scroll button that you can use to scroll up or scroll, scroll down. As you can see, at the bottom, you are given a control panel. So you can automatically switch from one question to another. As soon as you answer to the question, there will be an indication of a green light. What I like about computer delivered IELTS, if you are taking CD IELTS, you don't have to transfer your answers to the answer sheet because there is no such a thing like answer sheet.
you see it's convenient you will be typing your answers in the question so now how to manage your time IELTS officials test developers they recommend you to spend equal amount of time per passage if you read the instructions carefully they say you are recommended to spend 20 minutes on this passage you know what this method is good for beginners but it may it will not work appropriately if you are aiming for a higher band score it's quite risky so what is a risk how come you spend the same amount of time on passages which have different levels of difficulty I know that reading passage 3 is more challenging than reading passage 1 so why should I spend less why should I spend the equal amount of time on reading passage 3 so you, sh you, you see when you manage your time this way there is some risk that you will underperform in reading passage 3 this method is good for beginners, but go try other methods if you are aiming at a band score of 8 or above. Look at the second. Majority of IELTS instructors, they suggest you using 15, 20, 25 minutes method. So you see, you are taking out 5 minutes from reading passage 1 and investing it into reading passage 3. That's a there is a perfect balance right here. You see? So I'm saving five minutes for reading passage three, and I will have some extra time, some additional amount of time to analyze my questions and make my decisions in a more rational way. As the time passes, as you reach the proficiency level in reading passage, in reading component of IELTS exam, you will come to the third way. You will be spending 15 minutes for passage 1 and passage 2. You will spend 20 minutes for passage 3. And you will have 10 minutes of extra time that you can use for rechecking your answers. And here, by rechecking, I mean rechecking 5 or 6 questions in IELTS exam. In the whole IELTS exam, you can have up to 5 or 6 questions that cause you some sort of confusion. So, you know, there is a saying that in IELTS exam there are one or two specifically designed questions which are checking your ability or which are checking your worseness of getting a band score of 9. So I will be spending this 10 minutes of time just looking into two or three questions, rechecking my answers, try to analyze it more so that I will play it safe. You see? That's what professionals do use. Don't try to jump over your head. Leave this method for later stages of preparation. So now, let's look at question types. In IELTS reading, in the, in the reading component of IELTS exam, you, are, you can be given 12 question types. You don't have to remember how they are called. The only thing that you have to know is how to deal with each question type. For each of these question types, you will have to implement different strategies. You will have to learn some tips that will ease the process of solving these questions. So as you can see, we have 12 question types. The first two are not the same. We have true, false, not given, and yes, no, not given. Then you have multiple choice. Then you have matching type of questions, matching headings, matching information, matching opinions, matching features. You have classification, note completion, summary completion, sentence completion, which can be generally called as gap completion. And last but not least, we have completing diagrams. You can be given maps, some sort of flowcharts, like those from uh, writing task one. So for every question type, you should work one by one. You should solve at least like yeah, 20 plus questions and you should learn some strategies how to deal with them. In the following two lessons, I will teach you how to deal with true, false, not given, yes, no, not given, and multiple choice. So now, IELTS reading basics, basic strategies. Whenever you are taking IELTS reading exam, you should learn, you should master or before taking IELTS exam, you should master three important skills in reading, which are scanning, skimming, and predicting. So what is scanning? Scanning is your ability to find out a piece of information in a short amount of time. 
So you should learn how to quickly find out a specific piece of information. Skimming is reading the passage, you are flicking through the passage in order to get the main idea of a paragraph, in order to get the central idea of each paragraph. When you have questions like note completion, sentence completion, all the question types of completion, you have to do the scanning. When you have matching headings to paragraphs or multiple choice questions, you should learn how to skim the passage. Last but not least, we have prediction. And I guess in IELTS exam, the most important skill that you have to master is prediction. Now, let's look at IELTS reading prediction closer. Whenever you are making prediction, you should learn how to predict unknown lexical item, you should learn how to predict answer type, and you should also learn how to predict the content of a passage. Predicting unknown vocabulary. So, there are actually three ways of predicting unknown vocab. Under exam conditions, you have no dictionary that you can look up for a specific word. So, what you have to do? You can look at suffixes and prefixes. Let's look at this one, pre-departure. The word is given, it's pre-departure, so I have no idea pre-departure means. So I try to predict its meaning. I look at prefix, I look at suffix, I look at the root, yes? The root is depart. I know that depart is a synonym for leaving something. So when you look at the table, yes, in the airport, they have departure and arrival. So, what does it mean pre here, before? You know what is depart. So that means pre-departure means something that you do before leaving. So before leaving a country, you have to negotiate some steps. You have to complete some steps. So you see, cher, we have the suffix er, which means it's a noun. So pre-departure, it seems to me, it's a set of stages that you have to complete before you travel to other countries. Now look, if suffixes and prefixes are not enough to predict the meaning of this word, I will look at the words which come before and after unknown lexical item. Let's take an example. A cobra snake mesmerizes the mouse before attacking it. I know what a cobra snake is, I know what's mouse, I know what is attack. The only missing word is mesmerize. So I have no idea what mesmerize means. I read the sentence again and again, try to imagine that situation so that I can make a prediction. So now let's look at cobra snake. Let's imagine you have a cobra snake. It does some action, it completes some action with a mouse before attacking it. So I started recalling some movies, some books, which I read or watched it in my childhood. I remember there was a movie called The Karate Kid, and in one episode there was a cobra snake, which started mesmerizing the Karate Kid before attacking him. Or you remember a cartoon called The Book of Jungle, featuring Mowgli and Python. You remember that there was a python, it's a species of a snake, which mesmerized Mowgli before attacking him, before devouring him. Oh, go away. Leave me alone. Let me look at you. I just want to play with you. So you see, I already know what is the meaning of mesmerize. When you mesmerize somebody, you look into that person's eyes and try to hypnotize him. And now look, if I read this sentence and I still don't know what is the meaning of mesmerize, I try to take a bigger picture. Instead of looking at one single sentence, I read the full paragraph. I reread the full paragraph. So this third method is called using the context. You are reading several sentences in order to make a prediction of this unknown lexical item. Let's say my paragraph talks about doctors, mm -hmm. then it talks about surgery. So I imagine being in a surgery room, we are operating somebody, 
yes and we know that we are let's say translating his heart and we see that palpitation happens and after the palpitation the heart slows down slow it down so i try to think of what happened before the heart slowed it down so just try to recall what happened before so palpitation it's a medical term it's a medical term which tells me that something happens before the heart slow it down you know that before slowing down the heartbeat should accelerate so you see the heart should start beating quicker so i know now that palpitation is overly quick heartbeat so you see we have finished it now uh, we have learned now how to predict unknown lexical item you can predict unknown lexical item using suffixes and prefixes if this is not enough you can look at full sentence if the full sentence is not sufficient you can look at the whole context you can look at the whole paragraph now let's move on i was reading prediction like how to predict the answer type in question in many types of completion questions like note completion sentence completion table completion short answer questions you have to fill some fill the gaps with some number of words so you see you should learn how to predict the answer type here whenever you are predicting the answer type you have to make two type of predictions you should predict it grammatically and logically or lexically so what is grammatically here grammatically speaking you should tell me what should be the answer here is it noun is it adjective is it adverb it is, if is it like verb and if it is verb what type of verb is that is it a verb ing or infinitive or it should be a past tense so you see so i read the question now let's take a look at example what proportion of girls did team sports my keyword here is proportion so you see grammatically speaking i know that my answer should be a number because proportion it's a part of something most of the time a part of something is given in a form of a number in a numerical ex expression so i make a prediction my answer can be percentage my answer can be fraction and my answer can be a number given in a word form so you see in the text i can come across with 25 percent if i'm lucky or they can give a fraction you see one force or they can give a fraction in a word form a force or they can give me this sort of fraction as a noun form you see like is one out of every force or every force and now i have to do the lexical prediction so what does it mean lexical prediction i should highlight one or two keywords in the question and i have to find the paraphrase of these words in the text but before finding the paraphrase i should try to make a prediction of this paraphrase so look at the keyword girls i'm sure that they will not say girls they can give you age group like youngest females you see i'm making prediction i'm making lexical prediction of how girls will be paraphrased i can also make a prediction of how team sports will be paraphrased instead of saying team sports they can give me example they can give me example of sports like football volleyball basketball all of them are played in team and there always should be a distracting answer with other type of sports like karate individual type of sports you see like martial arts so now when i read a paragraph i see that a paragraph is about men so i don't have the answer in a paragraph i keep reading i look at b paragraph in b paragraph i see that they start talking about females they start saying recent surveys conducted among females so the word females is already enough for me to slow down and read the this part the relevant part of this passage in a more careful way so i keep reading they talk about martial arts but you know 
My answer cannot be martial arts. So you see, martial arts, it's individual type of sport. So when they say 25 of females were involved or were interested in martial arts such as karate, I will skip this part. Because karate, it's not a team sport. So let's move on. You just move on. You keep reading until you reach the word, let's say, football or basketball. So they give example of football. I know that football is a team sport. They talk about females and they gave me fraction, one force. So my answer should be one force. You see, I made prediction. I say that answer should be number. And I say that lexically speaking, my answer should be a type of team sport. You see? That's it. Last but not least, you should learn how to predict the content of a passage. Whenever you are predicting the content of a passage, you should carefully read title, subtitle, and illustrations or diagrams, I mean pictures, given in a passage. You know what? Back in childhood, when I studied at school, I couldn't make time to read this reading passages on history. And I remember attending these history classes at school, though it was like obligatory to attend them. Just before the start of the lesson, just before the start of the lesson, I always read the title, subtitle, and illustrations given in a passage. I couldn't spend 15, 20 minutes reading the whole passage because we had only 5 minutes or 10 minutes of break. So what I did, I read the title, subtitle, I look at some pictures, and when the lesson started, I raised my hand and said, can I go to the board, please? So can I start retelling the previous topic or the topic which was given as a part of home assignment? So, you know, most of the time, just knowing what is title and subtitle and like looking at some picture is already enough to tell, to predict what is the passage about. Now, let's look at this example. Bye Bye Panda. You see, we have Bye Bye Panda, it's my title, I have two, like you see, marks, I have a question mark and exclamation mark. Read the subtitle, how the Asian relatives of brown bear has been classified as endangered. And I look at illustrations, diagrams. Here you have an illustration of a panda. So now, look at the title one more time. In title, they say bye bye panda and put this question mark. So question mark is used here as like as a rhetorical question. That means this paragraph, this passage will tell me is the extinction of pandas going to happen. What about this exclamation mark? This exclamation mark tells me that now we have reached a point when pandas are being classified as endangered species. You see, that's a warning. The writer is warning me about the possible extinction of pandas. Look at the t subtitle. Asian relative of brown bear. By Asian relative of brown bear, I guess they mean panda. How pandas have been classified as endangered. So you see the word how, they will tell me a story. They will tell me a story of how pandas with stable population in the past, because of human activities, they were classified as endangered. And look at illustration. For those people who don't know what this panda is, possibly we have some candidates who have no idea what, what our pandas is, what are I mean, they gave some illustrations. Now, you know, when you read title, subtitle, and illustrations, you become more comfortable with the passage. You feel more convenient with the passage. Because you already have some expectations about the passage. Here, without reading the passage, what can I expect? I think first paragraph, they will talk about importance of pandas. The second paragraph, they will tell me a story. Like in, in the past, their population was stab stable. In the uh, like upcoming paragraphs, they will talk about human activities which pose it a threat to the population of pandas. 
In the last paragraph, I guess, of this passage, we'll talk about some breeding programs, conservation programs, which are aimed to secure, to maintain their population. So now let's check, check this out. The panda, with its distinctive black and white coat, is adored by world and considered as a national treasure in China. This bear also has a special significance for WWF because it has been our logo since our founding in 1961. So as you can see, they talk about pandas giving the like overall description of pandas. You see how they look like. Black and white coat, many people adore them, and in China they are considered to be a national treasure. What about B paragraph? Just read a few words from B paragraph. Pandas live mainly in temperate forests. Aha, uh -huh, you see? I already know that B paragraph will talk about the habitation. I mean the habitat of pandas. Where do they dwell? Where do they habitate? What is there? You see, I'm just looking at the word bamboo. I already know that this paragraph also tells me about the nutrition, the diet of pandas. What about third paragraph? As you can see, third paragraph says newborn panda. Aha. Uh -huh. I already know that this paragraph tells me about the reproduction of pandas. I will give you another example. Let's say the heading of a passage is Alfred Nobel. The subtitle of a passage is The Man Who Invited the Dynamite. And you are also given an illustration of Alfred Nobel. Or you are given illustration of the dynamite, how it looks like. So can you tell me what is the passage about? You can now pause the video for full one minute to think of what is the passage about to make a prediction of the content. So title is Alfred Nobel. You know that this will be this will be a passage about a scientist. About a scientist who invented the dynamite. And subtitle, ladies and gentlemen, already told me that he is an inventor. And I'm also given a like illustration of this person. So you know what? I guess in first paragraph of the passage, they will tell me about the, let's say, background of Alfred Nobel. Where he was born, what kind of family he, come, he came from, and etc. In the second paragraph, they will talk about his academic life, which university he graduated, what kind of, let's say, findings or discoveries he made, in the following paragraphs, they will talk about his achievements. What kind of, let's say, discoveries he made. And I guess at some point he will get married. Then the last two paragraphs will talk about the late years of this, let's say, yes, Alfred Nobel. And I guess the very, very, very last paragraph will tell me about the legacy which he left, heritage. You know that Alfred Nobel he is a founder of Nobel Fund, Foundation. And you know that annually, people who make contributions to scientific development, they are given the Nobel Prize. So you see, he is a founder of this Nobel Foundation and Nobel Prize. So the, this is the end of our today's lesson one. Hope to see you in upcoming lesson two and lesson three. For your notice, in lesson two, we will cover how to deal with true, false, not given. In lesson three, I will teach you how to deal with true, uh, yes or not given and multiple choice type of questions. See you. Thank you for your attention.